Hey there, astral travelers. I'm Pruitt. This is Jim Davis. And today we're going to project our fears of the astral dreadnought. So let's go ahead and cut that silver ribbon and open this episode of WebDM. <laughs> The Astral Dreadnought. Yes. Oh my God. This thing that slithers out of your nightmares <laughs> and, and snips your silver cord to reality. Right. How do you even like put this into like context, right? I mean, these things are gargantuan, they're, they're, right? they're big. So the Astral Dreadnought is this, uh, you know, a, a massive astral predator. They, they're only found on the astral plane. They can't be called anywhere else. They're mm -hmm. not found in any of the other outer planes. It's just this one, uh, you know, one of the transitive planes that they're in. You know, a high CR bruiser, right? They're not a mastermind monster or uh, or something mm -hmm. like that. They are just a natural predator of the astral plane and that happens to be, you know, tough as nails and, and hits like a truck, moves really fast. And to me, they, they're a type of high CR monster that I, I find are incorporate those elements of uh, of monster design that I was, I'm like, all high CR monsters need these things. You yeah. Know? And, and Astral Dreadnought ticks off all those boxes. It has some interesting tricks that are going on with it. And then it's got this lore that's connected to one of my favorite deities in in the D and D lore, right, right, uh, and 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 a suggestion of these creatures as the holdovers or leftovers or something of a massive cosmic conflict mm -hmm. that the reverberations of which are are still echoing through the D and D multiverse. Yes, and the astral dreadnought is proof of that, and is one of the ways in which you can like like we've suggested on other shows like tie your specific campaign world into a larger cosmic conflict. Astral Dreadnought's a monster you might consider using or, or, or having present uh, for those cosmic scale adventures that your uh, parties. Yeah, because have. basically a god like set these things loose to kind of guard heaven or right. guard the astral entrance to heaven. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, and yeah. I mean, it was like overthrown, but they still left them there, which I love the fact of the gods left these things there and they're like, well, we see their purpose. Right. So uh, Tharizadun uh, is this uh, Greyhawk deity that all the other deities of Greyhawk, lawful good, uh, chaotic evil, whatever it was, all of them got together and were like, we need to block you up. Yeah. And chain you away. Tharizadun wants to like erase existence. He's one of these sort of deities where the, the, the fact that things exist deeply troubles it. It sort of sits and plots, and, and in the context of Greyhawk, there's all these secret cults uh, to Therizadun. It's try it sets itself up uh, under these aliases, the Elder Elemental Eye, uh, and other things to sort of like create fronts for the cult, attract others. Sometimes it infiltrates other demonic cults, yeah. And takes them over from the inside. Right, right. It gives them a rebranding. Gives them a rebranding. <laughs> it can no longer grant spells to its clerics unless those clerics are still connected with some place of power from before Thurizadun was overthrown. So there are temples, you know, temples to Thurizadun deep underground and and in hidden places locked away where you can still draw clerical magic from that. So now it relies solely on uh, becoming like a warlock patron. You'll recognize Thurizadun from the great old one warlock patrons found in the player's handbook options, right? Like that's that's an option of, of a potential great uh, great old one patron. So it's this deity, the chained god, bound in this prison that every other god put them in, that's seeking any advantage to see its plans to overthrow existence uh, uh, be achieved. And the Astral Dreadnoughts are there to keep mortals and prevent mortals from visiting the homes of the gods, getting aspirations of godhood themselves. You can see as the plan overall is to like keep the various parts of the multiverse separate from each other and, and not interacting with each other and not like strengthening those bonds of creation. If you're engaged in a cosmic scale conflict, keeping the various parts of that conflict in the dark from communicating with each other, from traveling between, it's going to be uh, that's one way to win. Part of that, one way to win. That's sort of a divide and conquer strategy. So the astral dreadnoughts are a part of that divide and conquer strategy. That's like just left over. I would say more. It's like the the less that like the gods would leave them around, and and more just like the gods can't do anything. Like what what are you what are you going to do? Like the outside of their realms, the gods are you know less powerful than they than they perhaps would like us to leave, to think <laughs> yeah and so it may yeah. be that they can't get rid of it that maybe yeah. that that sort of that characteristic in that we see in the the creature stat block of like this is its home yeah it cannot leave this home it cannot it can't be whatever banished. 
you can kill them, but as the monster manual or Mordenkainen tells us, like they're in no danger of going extinct. <laughs> you know? Yeah, which which kind of scares the shit out of me. Like <laughs> thinking about travel in the astral plane, which leads you to believe, like, why the hell would you ever travel, knowing these things are out there? Right. Like, knowing why would you travel in the <laughs> astral plane, like, in a way that it could harm you? So because like it only could really kill you in one way. Right, it can kill you by severing your silver cord, which the yeah. silver cord rules are found in the astral projection uh, spell, which is a ninth level spell that, uh, that that the wizards, maybe warlocks can cast, I forget. It's a spell that lets you travel to the astral plane, do a bunch of stuff. There, there are things in the astral plane, right? There are uh, cities that are there, whether the Githyanki or others. There are planar travelers that use the fact that the astral plane is a transitive plane between mm -hmm. the outer and the, the prime material as a conveyance, right. you know, celestials, fiends uh, of all varieties uh, could could use that uh, to come and go, whether they're servants of the gods on missions of their own, they're trying to tempt mortals or, or something like that. Uh, getting from the outer to the prime material uses the astral plane. Mm -hmm. The astral plane is also a, you know, a, a more timeless place that, that you can adventure in. We'll kind of get to some of the specifics and particulars about yeah. adventuring in the astral plane uh, towards the end, but there's a lot of reasons why you might go, mm -hmm. but you will have, these are the kinds of predators that are there, and yeah, and you're just gonna have to deal with this uh, CR21 beastie. <laughs> okay, well, let's let's figure out what we're dealing with exactly. Right, right. Not only, I mean, they're gargantuan, we know that. Yes. You know, these massive, they come out of basically like nothing, kind of, their bodies just right. trail and form, and, mm -hmm. and then they just kind of fly around the astral plane pretty quickly. They've got some, some things going for them for an encounter, right? And mm -hmm. I think building an encounter here, these are not like a big boss monster that you want to like really kind of carefully plan, but because it's a, the stat block's big, got a lot of special abilities going on, um, you might not want to use these as just like a completely random encounter either. You want a, a fight with a creature like this to, to be a little bit more than like, oh, I rolled up Astral Dreadnought. All right, guys, roll initiative. What does it do? Oh, it's got some claws, things, some special abilities that you maybe hastily read through. So while you don't want to like plan a whole adventure or, or campaign arc around it, you might want to just at least give it some thought as to how you'll use it and, and the like, because it's got a lot going for it. And, and I think as a, as a high CR monster, uh, it can be really fun, and, and if you've got like really tough party, then you use it in conjunction with something else. And the actual Dreadnought becomes a minion for something, yeah. uh, which can well, be fun. I could see it as like a, a guard at the temple gates or something like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. You know, like it does guard a specific portal to an outer plane. Right. And the party needs to get to that portal. The party needs to get that portal, it, it boards that. You know, you could be part of like a Githyanki hunting party, hunting one of these that's in the region, or perhaps like a fight between the Githyanki and, and the party draws the attention of an Astral Dreadnought. Mm -hmm. But like in an encounter itself, the Astral Dreadnought has, what, 80 foot movement speed with hover. Yeah. Right, so it's moving quickly. And, and this is one of those things where it's like the, the rules for the astral plane and the rules for the monster kind of contradict each other as the rules for the astral plane sort of mention things like, oh, well, you move by your intelligence score and things like that. I would say as a creature native to the astral plane, it bypasses those sorts of restrictions. Those are rules for visitors yeah. who are projecting their consciousness into the astral plane, whereas the astral dreadnought is just, it, it flies through this silvery void. Um, so 80 feet of movement's pretty pretty fast. That's, I, I, to me, I see anything like greater than a dash action as a single move is what I'm, is personally what I'm looking for in movement rates for high CR monsters. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to zip around the battlefield quickly without having to use actions or reactions or and bonus actions, actions to do this or legendary actions. It's, it's sometimes nice to have a legendary action move. It can kind of get a, get a big monster out of trouble. But if that move isn't combined with something else, like say a, a, you know, the ability of a dragon to knock people prone with a wing burst as it flies away or something. I think Astral Dreadnought moves pretty quickly and the fact that it's got a lot of attacks. <laughs> you can, it's got it. But first off, it's got, it's, in terms of its defenses, it's got a high armor class. High armor class and a Fuck ton of hit points. Right, a lot of hit points. And those are just the average, right? You can always change the hit points on here. You can use max, you can roll the hit points, take the uh, the average and then roll hit points on top of it, combine those two numbers to get kind of a super beefed up, but less than max. You can start to see how the, the Astral Dreadnought is meant to 
challenge a party by being difficult to hit. Even AC20 at, at, at higher levels, it's not a, a done deal, right? Like you're, you're not, uh, there's still some elements of, of being able to miss, while in turn it has like plus 16 to hit. It's probably going to hit most of its attacks, if not, uh, if yeah. not all. Which it can get up to like with legendary six attacks if it wants. If it around. wants, right? And looking at the stat block, you kind of want to finish an opponent off with a bite, right? You want the you want the mm -hmm. uh, to take it into the uh, to the demi plane that uh, that it lives inside the astral yeah. dreadnought. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so not, maybe not only that, there's a demi plane in its belly. There's a demi plane in its in its belly. So you know you, we can imagine that the astral dreadnought's probably going to go later in the initiative order. It doesn't have a great dexterity modifier. Probably not going to go. But it's like picks an enemy that it, it wants to single out. And yeah. it, we are told in the lore that it instinctually knows about spellcasters. Yeah, and, and probably can feel that magic. I mean, can probably feel like, or sense, right. Like you said, when you're moving around the astral plane, you should, you're using intelligence, so high intelligence creatures would make themselves known. Yeah. You'd be able to sniff that out as a predator. Right, right, right. So if, you know, if it's going last and the party's taking a while to get to it or staying at range, you might use that three action sort of psychic burst that sends out a wave of psychic energy just to be like, okay guys, I'm here. You're, you know, you're not, I'm not just going to let you pick away at me until I get a chance to move. Yeah. But then when you are able to move, just like going like a missile towards the, your target and then unloading on them with your multi-attack and then being in a position to use the rest of your legendary actions now yeah. uh, so that you can claw, claw. Maybe they'll survive to the next time you can bite them. <laughs> mm -hmm. You might have to, to settle for knocking out a few of the opponents before uh, you get one of them in your uh, in your dungeon belly. Yes, your demi play <laughs> don donjon donjon. I call it just dungeon. It's dungeon. Uh, dungeon. It's, uh, the, it's French for dungeon. Yeah. Oh, donjon <laughs> et dragon. Right. Okay, got it. You know, you maybe use you know. your your other legendary action to like uh, you know send a big bruiser into the into the dungeon yeah. uh, demi plane for a round. And then, you know, you do it like right before your turn, so you get the big bruiser out of the way. Now you have free access to the squishies for your multi-attack. Mm -hmm. um, those are some ways that you can kind of like split the party, focus on enemies that, that are going to not be able to withstand your attacks. And then, um, you know, you can kind of pick apart the party like that, particularly if, if they're you know, not quite sure what to do, or if they're there by means of an astral projection spell, there's an opportunity that you crit them and they're just dead. Yeah. But that's the, <laughs> that's you, one of the you, terrifying you, things about You crit it. with those claws and you snip that cord. You snip that cord. And that's it. Right, and, and the astral projection spell is one of those that's the most common means of getting to the astral plane. I mean, you can portal, you can plane shift and the like, but astral projection is sort of the, the, the way you get there and it has a lot going for it. So the fact that an astral dreadnought can snip it, like Gith Yonki and like several other types of uh, monsters, psychic winds can also do it. Having that threat hanging over the party of like, if we tussle with this, and and this thing crits on us and snaps a silver core. That that's it. Like we're there, there, there's no save. There's no whatever. It's just you're dead. Um, yeah, you better get back within a minute and hope your cleric has recovered. <laughs> <by. laughs> and then uh, so that's part of where its threat comes from. And the the threat from that is is that let's say it snips the silver cord of a the party bruiser or something. You're not getting them back anytime soon. Like maybe if you get back to the material plane, your cleric can resurrect them or raise dead or yeah. something like that. I mean, you're but, probably around twentieth level, right? So you're gonna have higher, hopefully. Hopefully, but then you might have people that fall to this thing's bite, and now they're in the demi plane. So you've got you know uh, someone in the demi plane, someone who's died from a silver cord cut. Back on the prime and material. Then back on the prime material, and now let's say it just reduces someone to zero. Otherwise, which sends their spiritual body back to their physical body unharmed. But unless they're the caster and they've used their ninth level spot, slot that day to cast astral projection, then they're not going to be able to get back there. So, yeah. like this beast has a lot of potential to disrupt the party's plans, and it's not like at higher levels that death isn't something you can't easily overcome. This is an inconvenient monster to have snip your silver cord and yeah. someone else is in, a, in its belly. Yes, and uh, <laughs> an inconvenient brute, as it were. Right. It's a good trick monster for a high level party. It, yeah. It's, there's a trick to fighting it. Uh, stay at range. There's real Mobile danger there. AF. Yeah. A casual encounter with one of these could throw off the plans of the party entirely. 
which as a dungeon master I think is a good thing right it, yeah. it, it it's it has a high potential to complicate the campaign and to uh and, and to throw off the players i'm glad it was suggested to us i'd, I'd really like to try to use one of these in an actual encounter and see well, how it yeah goes. because i mean not only does it hits like a truck it's got a high ac a lot of hit points those resistances and immunities yeah are insane lots of defenses there it, you know so it's saving throws or would suggest that that peppering it with aoe spells is the way to go but it's got hit points to soak those up it's got a lot of resistances and then the legendary resistance means that it's it you know it can choose which one of the debilitating spell effects you're throwing at it that it wants to resist because the rest of them it probably has that immunity plus the fact that it can't be banished yeah like banish is one of those spells that you see dungeon masters complain about a lot yeah. Right, they, like just removing a creature from a fight, uh, whether it sends it back to its home plane or, or you know, temporarily sequesters it somewhere. The fact that you can't do that with this big bruiser, which you might normally be tempted to do with the banishment, is powerful because it's it's a it's one of those spells that I, I you read about a lot where parties once they get it, it it becomes a standard spell to cast. That banishment is always prepared by the people who can prepare it. That it's used uh, in every combat. It's kind of why people complain about it because it gets boring. In this case, no, you're you're not you're not banishing it. There's a lot of things it's immune to. It's got legendary resistance, lots of hit points, decent wisdom save. Um, it's probably going to stick around, and you're you're going to have to either kite this thing somehow, <laughs> or or risk uh, getting into melee with it and just hoping that you've got a party of just like wrecking balls that can take this thing out before it starts picking them off. Yeah, because there's no draxing this up where you jump down its mouth and fight it from the inside Not out. Not necessarily. It specifically no. says it can't be harmed from the demi-plane. It cannot be harmed from the demi-plane. you got to get there with a wish if you want to get there without being like swallowed. Yeah. You can escape with a plane shift. Uh, so there are some characters who might find their way in there and are able to escape. Well, and that might be an adventure also. Well, that's you're the looking thing, right? for yeah. the remains of... Whoever, of whether whoever it's your Githyanki there, yeah. like leader or yeah. an archmage or whatever, and it's like, oh yeah, it's that astral dreadnought with the red mark on his face. Right, which is going to be difficult because the yeah. astral plane is a featureless silvery void, right, with sparsely inhabited, in which thought and intent are more important than you know physical phenomena. It's a disorientingly weird place. So saying like, oh yeah, we fought an astral dreadnought somewhere. But our barbarian is missing. We don't know what happened to it all. It looks like it was swallowed whole. Usually when that happens, the barbarian bursts its, its way out of the stomach of the right. creature. Uh, not not so much this time. We lost one of our other members to a silver cord cut. We weren't able to get back. You know, it takes a full day to rest and recover, or at least a short rest if the, the wizard in question hasn't used their arcane recovery. Um, you know, it, it'd be difficult to... To, to get back there. You might be tempted to plane shift there instead of using astral projection just to be sure that you know, you're not vulnerable to the silver cord. Well, now you're the whole point of going there uh, using your astral body in the first place, which is that nothing bad will happen to you, nothing permanent, no permanent injuries, no permanent whatever uh, is negated. Now you're physically there. You run the risk of all the dangers that entails by refighting the astral dreadnought. And just straight up dying there. And your corpse is uh, floating in the astral void. Well, it will not decay. It will exist timeless and perfect for all eternity. <laughs> As a memorial to your <laughs> folly. <laughs> oh. So that's the kind of encounter that you want. Now, this is 5th edition. The, the game is sort of weighted in favor of the PCs. I think a clever party uh, working, with, uh, working with their strengths and have an understanding of the threat that they face can overcome this. You know? Yeah, you should be all 20th level. I mean, yeah. Near, I, or somewhere around that. Sure, tier 4. Tier 4, like and, you know, I played, I played a campaign recently there, and we did dish out a Fuck ton of damage every round. Right. So, well, brute, 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 I mean, brute we were AF. called brute force, brutal <laughs> AF. So, I mean, we're a lot of fighters, but still, you know, if you do it right and just throw caution to the wind, then you'll probably you'll probably be fine. So, yeah. I, or at the very least, you'll overcome. And maybe your dungeon master needs to throw two of these at you, or there needs to be like an archmage or something that's controlling them, it's or riding on its back, riding on its back, or something like that. You know, a, a, a githyanki lich, uh, something or other that that's manipulating an astral dreadnought, or a cultist of Therizadun that's that's using them for some nefarious purpose. Uh, you know, there's these 333 gems of Therizadun that it needs to collect, and maybe it's using an astral dreadnought to store. 
for them. Oh yeah, right. You know, it's, like it's got it, like two hundred and eighty mm-hmm. of them. It collects. It, you know, the cultist collects them on the various planar, multiplanar worlds or whatever. But then it travels to the astral plane, attracts this one particular astral dreadnought, and then feeds it the gem. When it's done, it itself, it, you know, the cultists themselves will be devoured by the astral dreadnought, awaken somehow. There's a lot of different ways you could pass your death saving throws. You could have mm-hmm. some sort of regeneration effect on you. All you have to do is be dropped to zero. Lots of ways of coming back, dropping to zero. Half orc could find themselves just in there, you know, uh, as they're the moment they recover that that brief moment when they're at zero, but between mm-hmm. zero and one get sucked into the uh, yeah. to the dungeon. Right? Well, I think it does say like either killed or incapacitated. You're killed so, or incapacitated, yeah. So, and, you know. Yeah, and so it, it doesn't need to kill you. You could, you know, you can imagine uh, someone making their way in there and not having a means of getting out and just being there. And maybe they're a scholar or a lore master of some kind that the party has to find and rescue and 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 bring out of hiding from somewhere. Maybe this cultist that's been gathering gems, the party g- catches wind of it and, and, and makes a point to go slay the astral dreadnought so that they can scatter the gems again. I'm going to be honest with our viewers, I kind of think the fact that the contents of its stomach reappear when it's dead is only a throwback so that players can recover some of their gear, and I would just have it be, it's gone. I, that's how I would. That's the change I would make. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I kind of like the the fact that its its contents are kind of disgorged, disgorged upon death because this thing just kind of folds in on itself mm-hmm, into nothingness mm-hmm. again. I think I lean towards the annihilating it because it's like I look at that as more of a throwback to players, and at, at that level of the game, I don't offer a lot of. It, you, you, the, you guys are playing epic level characters. We can, if you, you know, you should have like multiple sets of gear for stuff. <laughs> like, just what's losing some gear? You know, you just go back and re uh, and, and get it back. And besides, if, if it kills your astral self, the astral projection spell copies your gear anyway. Right. So I mean, it's, it's not, not really gear. your it's gear. Not, yeah. Those are some interesting uses for it. In, in in terms of just like astral adventures, the astral plane is a silvery void of a, a, a featureless sort of environment uh, and, and it's a realm of thought and dream physical creatures that you know that travel there with their material bodies they don't age they don't need to eat they don't need to drink right like the githyanki have to maintain settlements in the prime material in order to just age to grow up <laughs> right yeah. you know have babies to have babies and raise young and, and, and all these other kinds of things, presumably enjoy food and, and or get drunk or something. This is the realm where, where that isn't uh, a concern. For those visiting by certain spells, you have, you know, your intelligence score determines how far you move. Your mental ability replaces your physical abilities in some versions of this, uh, of the astral plane. I remember in second edition, you use your intelligence score for your strength, your wisdom for your dexterity, and your charisma for your constitution. Like, completely revamped your uh, your character when mm-hmm. on the astral plane. And so, like, there's a lot that's there. It's a timeless realm, so anything that needs to be kept in temporal stasis might be stored on the astral plane. There are dead gods there, or more accurately, the dormant corpses of gods who do not have enough followers to revive them. Right. To bring them back. <laughs> to bring out. them back. Mm-hmm. Dead God is a more prosaic way of putting it. But Githyanki make their home on them, but who's to say that someone didn't lock some artifact away there out of time and out of uh, physical reality to keep it safe? And and they themselves astrally project uh, into this world so that they can like keep this artifact safe and stuff, but they have a temporal realm where they live. There's a monastery where they reside or, or some focal point on the prime material where they're at, or, or maybe they don't. Maybe they travel there physically and the first people to have ever placed this artifact there in time stasis are, are themselves there. They're, they're, it's just them. They don't age, they don't whatever, they've just lived there. So I like, I like the astral plane for the, those kinds of adventures. It's, it's a fun place for wizards to set up a, a, a you know a tower or your bad guy to have a, a secret refuge of some kind. In terms of what you do on there other than find astral dreadnoughts, <laughs> there's uh, Githyanki are probably the most commonly encountered thing on the astral plane, but there's other planar travelers, angels, other celestials, fiends, devils, yugoloths, um, any sort of like planar traveling creature or, or, or entity will use the astral plane to get from point A to point B because the astral plane is full of color pools which link the prime material to the various outer planes. And if you know the color of the color pool, 
they're on page 47 of the DMG, uh, then you can sort of like know that like, okay, well purple leads here and blue leads here and you start to know which where you're going and that's how you get around the astral plane. Maybe you've been there long enough that you're able to just sort of think your mm -hmm. way towards a particular color pool. Uh, you might look towards the fourth edition uh, products that, uh, that detail the astral sea as offering uh, perhaps a, another interpretation of the astral plane, what might be there. But there's a lot going on. Uh, I, I think an, enough for an adventure, if not like a whole campaign or something. Oh yeah, yeah enough to get up to some fun when you travel there once or twice. Yeah, when your uh, when your barbarian inadvertently uh, walks into a, a a pocket dimension with his bag of holding still on his hip, right? And, and everybody shunted. gets <laughs> shunted into the astral plane, and now right. you got to figure out how to get back. Got to figure out how to get back. What do um, one of these color pools do? Uh, those kinds of things. Yeah, got to mm -hmm. avoid the psychic wind, which can sever silver cords. Got to watch out for that. Yeah. Wait yeah. a minute. So, banishment. If you're on your own home plane. Yeah. Just shunts you to a pocket dimension. It shuts you to a pocket dimension. Yeah. So that's an extra dimensional space. Sure. Yeah. So. If you're fighting an enemy mm -hmm. and you're about to banish them and you're on their home plane, mm -hmm. would it behoove you to then throw a bag of holding at them and then do it? Would you then rule that that person, if they fail their save, gets shunted into the extra dimensional pocket while holding a bag of holding? That's extra dimensional in extra dimensional. Would yeah. that then I mean, spill I, them I, into I, the I actual I might allow something like that. I'd probably want to read back up on the way which specifically it works in... in uh, because I, I, I'm trying to remember if it's a if it's any extra dimensional space or if it's just like when you bring a portable hole and a bag of holding together. Because like it, it'd be, if it's any extra dimensional space, and that would mean like you could never bring a bag of holding into a rope trick mm -hmm. or no. something like that, or a right. uh, or a mag magnificent mansion. So we, we might be. I know there there have been editions of D and D where that's been the case, mm -hmm. right? Like any extra dimensional space with any other extra dimensional space creates this tear, which put you in the astral. So I, I, I don't know, I kind of like that. You, you'd have to get the bag of holding on to the villain. You know, an arcane trickster could do yeah, it. do it uh, a sleight of hand. Sleight of hand, you know, just someone who's grappling them could like take the bag of holding and stuff it in a, a shirt pocket or something like that. If the villain that. wants something, you're like, fine, here, take it. And and take you, it you and toss banish them, them this and bag. Like send them there, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think mostly for me, I'm just now curious what the rules are for portable holes and bags of holding and the like in extra dimensional spaces. Because my suspicion is, is that the Wizards of the Coast wants to avoid a situation where the, the party can't bring their bag of holding into a rope trick or a magnificent mansion mm -hmm. or a demi-plane or something. See, I didn't allow them to bring it onto Rontame because all the buildings are extra Extra dimensional spaces, yeah. So I, I think, I, I don't know, I, I, rem I remember that there's the there's a lot of places in like the D&D &D fiction where the the, the the heroes use use both of those, so I don't know. And Trist, it was a chest and a bag of holding. Well, you, there used to be a spell, Leoman's Tiny Chest, that yeah. summoned your own, like it, it was like a bag of holding uh, yeah, yeah. that you conjured yourself. So like that's kind of one, that's an extra dimensional space with, with a portable hole, I think. There's a lot of things you can do and you can find yourself on the astral plane by accident because of that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, a place that Hi, the higher level you go, you greater likelihood of adventuring. It's not like the ethereal. Like the ethereal is to me much more accessible. Yeah. And the ethereal is uh, is also one uh, that I see as a uh, you know closer to the material. Right. There's the deep ethereal, the shallow ethereal. It sort of mimics the world, uh, the material world that's there. But the astral plane is like you know that's where you get up to like. You sail the, the the void between stars, kind of place. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, check it out. Maybe use an astral dreadnought whenever they visit. Uh, and uh, there you go. And watch your players cry. Of course, I'm wearing my One Punch Man shirt for the Ant Monsters because. One punch. It's like literally the Saitama version of these is just like. Yeah. Well, you're gonna want to use a super serious punch on the Astral Dread. Super serious punch. <clears throat> Ready? Consecutive normal punches. Super serious punch. <laughs>